Hi, welcome to Worship and Word with me, Reverend Stuart Dyer. Great to have you with me, however and wherever you're joining me from today. A call to worship. This is from Singing the Faith number 43, written by Timothy Dudley Smith. Come, let us praise the Lord, with joy our God acclaim. His greatness tell abroad and bless his saving name. Lift high your songs before his throne, to whom alone all praise belongs. Amen. And the prayer of approach today is written by John Sims from the Methodist Prayer Handbook. Hospitable God, you spread a table in the wilderness and invite all to come and share in your goodness. May we always make your world a place for all, whoever they are, whatever they look like, whoever they love, wherever they have been or whatever they have done. May all find welcome, acceptance and grace through our service and witness in your world. May we welcome them in the name of the one who opened his arms in love for the whole world, Jesus, our Saviour and friend. Amen. And a prayer of confession from Angela Bryden, who is the uh, discipleship enabler, both in our circuit and in our district. Forgive us, Lord, when we try to go back to the way things were. When we fail to seize the new opportunities as they arise. Forgive us, Lord, when we hold on to traditions without meaning, because we have always done it that way. Forgive us when we cling to the gospel message rather than sharing it with others. Lord, may we truly listen for your calling and seek your guidance so that your will may be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. Our reading today is taken from the lectionary uh, for this Sunday and it is a reading from the Gospel of Mark starting in chapter 10 at verse 46. We are continuing with our series, uh, preaching series on money, which may not seem immediately obvious from the reading, but uh, bear with me. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. In our time of intercession today, uh, following the sad death of David Amos earlier this week, I'm going to be deliberately using the prayers uh, included in the litany of the Book of Common Worship, section 5, which leads us in prayers for those who are in government. So let us pray. 
Loving God, may you guide the leaders of the nations into the ways of peace and justice. Hear us, good Lord. Guard and strengthen your servant, Elizabeth, our Queen, that she may put her trust in you and seek your honour and glory. And we pray for a swift recovery from her recent stay in hospital. Hear us, good Lord. In due the High Court of Parliament and all the ministers of the Crown with wisdom and understanding. And we pray at this time especially for the family and colleagues and friends of David Amos in their grief. Hear us, good Lord. May you bless those who administer the law, that they may uphold justice, honesty and truth. Hear us, good Lord. Give us the will to use the resources of the earth to your glory, for the good of all creation. Guide and lead all those who gather next few weeks at the COP26 in Glasgow. Hear us, good Lord. Bless and keep all your people. Bring your joy into all families. Strengthen and deliver those in childbirth. Watch over children and guide the young. Bring reconciliation to those in discord and peace to those in stress. Remember those who are alone. We lift to you those who are isolated. In all these things, and all the many more within our hearts and minds, hear us, good Lord. And we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, as I said at the beginning of the reading, this passage might not immediately seem to have anything to do with uh, money or our concerns about uh, what Christianity and the New Testament and the Gospel of Jesus Christ in particular might have to say to us about how we deal with money, how we think about money in our lives. What I want to do today is to contrast the story of blind Bartimaeus with the previous story, the one we had last time we were together online, the story of the so-called rich young man. And I want to draw the parallel between the two because I think that's what Mark is doing himself, the writer of this gospel, by putting these two in fairly quick succession. I think he's begging us to contrast the two stories as readers to say, well, this is what happened in this situation. This is what happened in the next. Notice to begin with that we know the name of Bartimaeus, whereas the rich young man, as titled by Bible compilers, there is no such title in the original version or in the Greek, is just described as a man in the Gospel of Mark. A man. Why do we know the name of Bartimaeus? Well, I think we, I hope we're not doing a spoiler here, but Bartimaeus ends up following Jesus. The man doesn't. So he remains unknown to the disciples. Didn't know who he was, didn't know where he came from, didn't hear from him again. Whereas Bartimaeus is included into the disciples. So we know his name. One other sort of parallel with the story is the notice that in the story of the young man, it's the young man who comes to Jesus and asks him a question and says, what one thing must I do? So this centrality of what is this one thing? What, what's the dynamic of the relationship with Jesus? And I want to compare that with Bartimaeus. For in the story of Bartimaeus, it's Jesus who says, what is it you want me to do for you? What is the one? What is it you want? What's the thing you're after? In the young man, it's what one thing must I do? 
in order to receive eternal life. He's thinking in terms of actions and his agency. Whereas Bartimaeus immediately says, well, I want to receive from you. I need what you have. What is the one thing that's important to you? For the rich young man, it's something I can do. For Bartimaeus, it's something only, Lord, you can give. I also notice that there's a sense of entitlement going on here. Sometimes what is not said is as important as what is said. The young man goes up directly to Jesus. Now, I want to be careful about, one mustn't assume too much, of course, by what is not said. But being a wealthy person in that society meant that the young man did have certain privileges. Notice that no one tries to stop the young man from going to Jesus. There's no pushing through the crowd. There's none of that calling out, David, David, son of David, have mercy on me. Because he is wealthy. His place in society means he can walk straight up to Jesus and say, teacher, here's my question for you. And he is received as such. Whereas Bartimaeus is ignored. Bartimaeus has to call out and people go past. And I, I get a sense, just as a reader, in that sense of Bartimaeus calls out. They tell him to shut up. Don't be, don't be bothering Jesus. He doesn't want to talk to you, the likes of you. He calls out all the more. And I, I sense something in that response that he then gives up because the crowd have to say to him, take heart, get up. He's calling you. He has heard you. And he, perhaps he'd stopped or didn't think that anything would happen. Compare that to the sense of entitlement of the young man in the previous story. He has to be encouraged to come. But I think what I want to say about these two individuals, Bartimaeus and the young man, is that one of them is more in line with us and lives his life as a consumer, and the other is more interested in a communion. What I think is so transparent in the New Testament Gospels is the amazement, the amazement of the disciples and the people who encounter Jesus and receive from him of the life that is in the person of Christ. And that is also followed through in the letters that the disciples write later. The disciple John writes in the beginning of, of his gospel, uh, in that famous passage known to many of us, that what has come into being in him was life. That the person of Jesus in himself is life. And Jesus said in one of the gospels there, I am the way, the truth and the life. But what I want to draw out today is the difference between a life that has to depend upon consumption and a life that depends upon communion. The two are very different. The two modes of being are very different. For Christians, being in relationship with God is equal to or is saying you have eternal life. What is eternal life? It is fellowship with God. Being in relationship with God. Be, why? Because God gives of himself to us. God is the source of life. God is life. And when we are in the presence of that life, it comes to us as well. The Hebrew word for, the, for fellowship, for communion, for partnership uh, is very clear to leave a bit of distance. It's not a word that we might translate as fellowship or communion. It tends to be translated as something like the fear of the Lord or something like that because the uh, people of Israel were very cautious about this. Their encounter with the raw life of God was that it was so powerful that for people who were mortals it actually could be deadly. It was over, so overwhelming that you couldn't exist in it. That life force was so powerful. And there are many examples of um, that being described as the holiness of God. What's fantastic uh, in the New Testament is that 
God has sent his son Jesus to mediate that life to us. He has um, put it, so to speak, uh, bespoke as a human being. He's kind of wrapped it up into a human form so that we can engage with it in a way that actually brings out our own humanity that is acceptable to us, that we can see and touch and hear, we can have fellowship with. We cannot have fellowship with God purely on a God to individual basis. If I was to try and attempt to have communion with God in the raw, so to speak, I would, wouldn't survive. I can, however, commune with God through the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we describe him as our priest, our mediator. He has come. But the key thing here is that it's communion. I often say this, when God blesses us, God blesses us with the person of Christ. God comes to us in the fullness of Jesus and gives us Jesus. If you're needing comfort, what God gives you is comfort in Christ. If you're needing reassurance, the reassurance you get is in the person of Christ. Jesus is not cut up and packaged out into little parcels of God to us. God gives us the fullness of Christ. That is always the way he blesses us and communes and has fellowship with us, which is amazing and should make us uh, respond with awe and wonder. So what do we do? How do we respond to this? Well, really, I want to talk today just very briefly and leave you something to think about thinking about money, thinking about how we live our lives. And my analogy is drawn on two things which are very much in the news at the moment. The petrol engine, the combustion engine, versus the battery engine of the electric car. Now, it's oh, an analogy that has its limits, obviously. Both of these require energy, and we can argue about whether the uh, battery manufacturer is, is uh, ecologically friendly, etc., but there's something about the character of these two ways of transforming energy that I think might have a lesson for us in our relationship with God. The combustion engine is essentially constantly hungry. It only has as much energy as the last drop of fuel that's gone through the engine and been sparked and turned into a small explosion. As soon as that, there is no more fuel, that's it. The whole thing's dead. Whereas the battery ha carries a great store of energy, which is slowly released as needed into the engine system. It's a much less hungry system. It starts from a place of fullness and gradually diminishes. Now, obviously, you could say, well, the petrol tank starts from a place of fullness, but it's the character of the engine I'm getting at. One requires constant feeding, the other needs to be full up first and then slowly ekes that out across the journey. There's a lesson there for us, I think. Are we living our lives as consumers or are we living our lives as communers? The gospel is clear and John especially writes in his letters and in his gospel about having fellowship with God and fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, and that that is eternal life. Having all things in common with God, living in communion with God, living a life that acknowledges God and which seeks to replicate that life of God in ourselves. That is eternal life. God living in us by God's very presence brings eternal life. So it's communal. It's a living in fellowship. That is where the life is. And that also extends to us as people of a community. I wonder how many of us, however, feel often that we live more like the petrol engine, constantly having to consume a new thing. I know we need food for our, we need food for our bodies, but how many other things do we see as something we just need to consume and get 
and get more and keep having it. I wonder how much of the recent panic over petrol uh, and goodness knows what else, Christmas toys, etc., comes not from a place of community or a place of communing, storing up that energy, but rather from a place of consumption. I must get this. That's my next thing. I, I need to get that. So I think the challenge of the Gospels is to engage with that eternal life that God offers us. And perhaps we recognise that when the batteries of our souls in being in fellowship with God are so full of that love and of that wonderful sense of being part of God's love that we might find we don't need to consume quite as much. That we might find that we can let some things go and we should find that we react differently to the things that are placed in front of us and perhaps even, yes, some of the opportunities for consumption that are put in front of us. May we, like Bartimaeus, discover the joy of receiving that fellowship and blessing of God and being welcomed into that community where we can experience that love and where everybody does know our name but most especially we know God in us and that is eternal life. So what's up this week? Well, if you are very quick off the mark, you might still have time to get down to Southdown Methodist Chapel, where the Reverend Richard Lowson will be leading our Harvest Festival. Uh, thank you so much to the children and workers of the preschool, uh, the staff team there for, for making this lovely display. So if you want to see that in person, it'll be up for the next few weeks, but you can get along this morning and take part in the Harvest Worship there. 10.30 at South Down. Uh, we'll be online on Zoom at four o'clock this afternoon for our Sunday gathering and unsurprisingly we'll be thinking about harvest. And also this week, uh, staying in South Down, uh, please note the new time for evening prayer at South Down Chapel. Uh, we've listened to feedback and we've moved that to 6pm in the evening, so that's a short informal but quiet reflective service of evening prayer that's at 6 p.m at south down methodist chapel this wednesday at the 27th and if you'd like to join us online for bible bites that's taking place on the 27th at 7 45 just drop me an email for a link to that uh, if you haven't already received it via email that would be fantastic good to see you there and then looking forward to next Sunday, the 31st, at nine o'clock in the morning, we are having another of our fabulous breakfast churches. Uh, it's a relaxed breakfast group for all ages. All are welcome. That starts at nine o'clock at Southdown Chapel. Uh, it's a very short thing. There will be about 15 minutes thinking of uh a story, uh, some singing and some active prayers and there will be a light breakfast which of course is free and again we're very grateful to the good folk from the cafe next door, the good kitchen who will be providing our yummy tea and coffee for us so do join us for that if you can and then we also have on that Sunday evening at six o'clock in the evening at Redbourne Chapel we're delighted to have the fantastic John Watson who's been able to move things around in his diary uh, to be able to be with us a little bit earlier, so 6pm on the evening of Sunday the 31st, to uh, lead us in our songs of praise. So what we're going to be doing is asking folk from Redbourne and surrounding areas to share their favourite hymn, tell us a little bit about why they like it, what it means to them, and then we'll have a go at singing it together. And I think John's also got one of his new songs which he's going to teach us and we're going to join him with as well. So we're very, very blessed to have John with us there. Uh, do join us if you can. That's Sunday the 31st of uh, October at Redbourne Methodist Chapel, 6pm in the evening. We look forward to seeing you at one or some or all of those events, and uh, we hope to see you there soon.
Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I pray you have known something of God's grace and love in our time together. So now for whatever you go back to, whatever awaits you and I in the days and weeks to come, the blessing. May the Lord bless us and preserve us and keep us from all evil. And may we abide and commune with him in eternal life. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all you love, now and always. Amen. Oh, 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 sweetie!